All right, hi everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're just gonna wait a minute or so so everyone can arrive and join us. Okay, so today we've got a fantastic talk from Dr. Natalia Ares. Uh, before that, I have uh, a few announcements to make. Um, so people have been using our Twitter and emailing us job adverts, which is great, this is fantastic. Um, we have three to show you today. Um, there's an advert for a new workshop in September, the Nanomechanics Online Mini Workshop. Um, there's a PhD position being advertised from Nordic Center India, and the Langevin Institute is recruiting postdocs. I couldn't fit them all on this screen, so here you can see these fantastic adverts. Um, if you're on Twitter, follow our account because we retweet all of these opportunities and uh, seminars. Um, so the nanomechanics online mini workshop sounds really interesting if you're working on tiny nanostructures, um, photonic crystals, uh, cooling, all of that fantastic stuff, um, consider joining. It's a free, I think it's free and I think it's gonna be an online event. Coming back to the main program, um, let's try and use the chat function today. Um, so I think we've been doing this for a few weeks now, and I think we can all branch out and be brave. And if you just type into the <laughs> chat box, hello, <laughs> um, and maybe um, where you're joining us from in the world, um, what your research is, any interest you have, let's just see if we can get some conversations going. For those on YouTube, you can also um, put something into the chat box on YouTube. This is how you'll be asking questions that we can raise here. Um, and Madassa is on hand to chat with you there. Um, so let's see, let's see what's going on. Let's see if I can even look at the chat box. Um, Sophia, do you want to uh, call out any <laughs> chat that's happening? Uh, yeah, we'll, um, oh yeah, so we have some people saying hi from Sydney, uh, we have some hi's from Birmingham, and um, James Millen is saying hi Natalia directly from, from London. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in, we look forward to this talk. Fantastic. Okay, so be longer than the perspective talks that we've had before. Um, so you don't have to remember your questions, just drop them in and we'll do them all at the end. Um, Edward Laird is going to be chairing the session, so he will introduce Natalia um, and then he'll be chairing the Q&A at the end. Um, and you can ask questions right at the end if you want to ask them you know, live with your own voice um, by just simply pressing the raise hand symbol and then we can unmute you and then you can actually have a discussion with Natalia as well. Um, so with that being said, um, we have another thing which is next week we don't actually have a speaker confirmed for a perspectives talk. So this is kind of like a 20-25 minute talk. Um, if you have a talk that you've prepared and you want to do it then please let either me, Modassa, Sophia or just send an email um, to the Unicorn uh, email address um, and we will try and figure out how to fairly allocate this speaker's slot. Um, we'll, we'll try and be transparent but I mean it's empty and it's a week away so we're really not picky right now. Um, so please don't hesitate to nominate yourself or nominate someone else. Um, and so from that being said I'm going to hand over um, to Edward um, and he will introduce Natalia and her talk. Good, thank you very much. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Natalia Ares, who will be uh, talking about the application of optomechanics to thermodynamics. Um, Natalia started as an undergraduate in Buenos Aires in Argentina, and where she worked, I believe she was a theorist then, working on quantum chaos. Um, and she then moved to Grenoble for her PhD. She worked in the group of Silvano de Franceschi, working on spin qubits in silicon nanowires. Um, she then moved to Oxford 
uh, where we started working together. And she's been now in Oxford for, I think, six years, uh, where she has been, let me make sure I get this right, Natalia. She has been successively a Marie Curie fellow, a junior fellow at St. Anne's College and a Royal Society University research fellow, which she is at the moment. So Natalia, it's a great pleasure to have you. And I will start off um, by interviewing you for a few minutes about your, your physics you. career. Could you tell us first of all, how you became interested in physics? Oh, that, uh, that's a good question. Well, first, uh, thank you, Ellen. Um, great, um, thank you for the introduction. And uh, you know, it's a real pleasure to be here. And um, as you mentioned, we work together. So that's, that's very nice. And um, yeah, how did I become interested in, in physics? Well, that's uh, um, uh, actually a, an interesting, interesting question because I, I didn't know it was, you know, being a physicist was an option. I thought, uh, you know, you could be a medical doctor, uh, you could be a lawyer, but uh, physics was not really, um, you know, one of the things that, that I thought it was, it was possible. So, um, the way I, I became acquainted with physics was that, um, of course, I had of it at, at school, but I, I really didn't get the full picture there. So I, um, I was going to a, a, a course for, for um, um, you know, for, for school children about um, science. Uh, this is in, in, in Buenos Aires in, in, in uh, what is there, the, the Atomic Center. And I thought it was... Uh, you know, I thought it was very exciting and I thought it was, um, you know, that we could do like small experiment, like, uh, experiments like even playing out with, with liquid nitrogen and, and I thought that was um, a really exciting. And then uh, I realized, you know, sometimes people would come and speak and, and give talks and then I realized some of those people were physicists and really, you know, you could be a physicist and, and it was a really cool job. So I thought, oh, well, that's, that's what I, what I uh, want to do. So I think it is, um, you know, I, I, I guess from that experience, I, I, I think it's, um, it's very important to, uh, you know, uh, do our rage and talk and, 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 and because, uh, you know, you, you don't know um, the people that you can be inspiring and, um, you know, and uh, you help them uh, discover what you're, what they are really passionate about. So um, I'm really glad I went to that course when I was, um, when, the, when I was a, ch a child, really. Thank you. And you have an unusual biography in that you started your research career in Buenos Aires. Um, could you tell us what were the best things about studying in Argentina and what differences did you find when you moved to Europe? Well, I, I mean, uh, I, I don't think I um, have an unusual background in the sense that I, you know, I studied uh, physics um, in one very, very good university. This is um, the University of Buenos Aires. It's, uh, uh, you know, in the QS world ranking is something like 66 or something. And it's, it's going to be, um, it's uh, 200 years, it's, it's going to become 200 years old next year. So it's, it's a great university. And, um, and then, you know, I moved, uh, as you said, I moved um, to a PhD in France, in physics and, um, you know, things, okay, apart from the, the fact that I changed from theory um, in my master's to, um, to experiments, um, you know, it was uh, not that um, much of a change in, in terms of professionally, I would say, but, um, Something that I do think it is unusual uh, of my background, I think, compared to other people that are in academia, um, not everybody, of course, and this is very personal, but I think I did um, what is unusual. I think it's that um, I feel that I made a big sacrifice. Um, I, you know, moving so far, uh, being young, and um, uh, it, was, it was difficult. I won't say that it was easy, um, but, um, but yeah, I had, um, I think I gained a lot from that experience and I keep on, um, you know, uh, learning a lot from the different places. Um, you know, I lived in France now in the UK and, um, yeah, they, they have been fabulous, uh, opportunities and I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that I, I did that, um, the jump. Okay. The ocean jump. <laughs> Good. 
So I know you have moved around a little bit between different fields, and I know that as well as quantum thermodynamics, you have interests in artificial intelligence for quantum devices. Could you tell us generally, what is your approach for selecting scientific questions to work on? Well, uh, you know, uh, although as I said, you know, I started doing quantum chaos, that it's uh, super theory. Uh, well, now it's starting to become a bit more um, experimentally approachable, but um, I really like topics where I feel that experiments can really make a, a significant contribution. I, I really, uh, I think what I find really exciting is when I'm in the lab and, you know, seeing these effects happening and being able to really, uh, you know, contribute to the knowledge uh, in one particular area. So I feel that both on the uh, thermodynamics on, the, well, I'm going to tell you a bit more about it today uh, and in the machine learning, I feel that it's a really real need for experiments that are, um, that might be able to make us move forward on those fields. So, you know, I'm really, I'm, I, I think I'm driven by, by very interesting experiments that might able, that might allow us to really go forward uh, with, with the, that, you know, might unlock um, something in the way we see a field. And I, I feel that uh, quantum thermodynamics and, and the machine learning side have, have, are not as well explored and that there's still room for experiments that might uh, have that effect. Um, Good, thank you. Well, we'll look forward to hearing about many more experiments like that then. <laughs> but for now, I will leave you to uh, proceed to give us your talk on circuit optomechanics for thermodynamics at the nanoscale. Okay, thank you very much, Edward. So um, I guess I'll uh, share my screen. Uh, oh, sorry, something. Uh, it's not behaving, but I'm gonna share screen. Oh. Okay. Um, okay, I found. I found it. Um, can you see? Yes, that? it's working. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, so um, as I said, I'm going to talk about circuit mechanics uh, for the thermodynamics at the nanoscale, and I hope to give a perspective uh, really on this on this topic. So the way I, I would um, structure my talk is in the beginning, I'm, I'm going to tell you a bit more about what do I mean by thermodynamics at the nanoscale and what, why do I think it's interesting. And um, then I'm going to talk a bit about what is it coming back to experiments, not what is the experimental state of the art and how circuit optomechanics really fits in that picture. And uh, once I'm there, I'm going to tell you a bit more about, you know, dream experiments on quantum uh, thermodynamics. So uh, let me start. Um, so, you know, one of the uh, most groundbreaking experiments in physics really goes back to 1849, when, when Schull demonstrated with this apparatus here that uh, the work of a falling weight could be converted into the heat of agitation in water. And this experiment was at the heart of the first law of thermodynamics, which was followed by the second law and the introduction of entropy. Um, so now what I think it's uh, very interesting is to try and understand what happens with heat work and entropy in a small scale in which fluctuations are important and quantum effects might arise. So just to give you an idea what I mean by work and heat and entropy, for example, in a two level system, um, let me show you. Now in a microscopic system, we have a, a gas, you know, that can perform work and lift a load, for example. Now, in, the, um, in, in a uh, two-level state, for example, we would uh, think as work as, a, the, as the ability of performing excitations in a two-level system. So um, this, imagine that if you, if you have uh, many of these two-level systems, then we can perform microscopic work, for example, in the case of laser. So um, this is the picture. Uh, we want to explore and where we, we want to find these correlations between, you know, uh, or, or these uh, correspondences uh, between the classics and the quantum uh, thermodynamics or, or really uh, the thermodynamics at uh, really small scales. 
There is another very interesting aspect of thermodynamics that has to do with the concept of information. So um, this was um, a concept that uh, was, well, I mean, this started as an experiment uh, that Maxwell uh, proposed in 1867 to show um, like some like apparent uh, paradox for the second law of uh, thermodynamics. And, uh, you know, just to um, not remind you, but, um, you know, uh, put in context these experiments, you remember that, uh, you know, you can remember from uh, this this um, kind of a song that says that um, trying to describe the second law of the thermodynamics that says heat won't pass from the cooler to the hotter. Uh, you can try if you want, but you are far better not. -er. And uh, <laughs> and I think you know that's um, that's uh, what in principle we know about the second law of, of uh, thermodynamics. Um, but uh, what um, this uh, thought experiment um, was saying is that, well, okay, I mean, I, I do understand this, um, heat won't pass from the cooler to the hotter, but something I can do is I can grab a box, uh, separate it in, in two parts, and then, uh, well, I, would, I, I can have it with hot uh, particles mixed with cold particles. And then something I can do is try and uh, take a peek and see what's, um, you know, the velocity of, of these particles. And, uh, if I see that um, there's gonna be a particle that it's hot, I can leave it, you know, I can open a little door, the white door there, and leave it go to the hotter side. Um, so it's basically uh, what it's doing is trying to, um, you know, um, pass heat from the cooler to the hotter. So now why is this not uh, a violation of the second law of thermodynamics? Well, the reason is that you have to know um, well, there is a bit of information that you require. You require to know the velocity of the particles that are involved. And um, that's the only way you can really uh, act against um, the second law. And so it's all taken care um, for uh, in, in if, if we think that information has a cost and a thermodynamic cost. And, um, and this is a very interesting aspect of thermodynamics that can be taken uh, that can also be taken uh, to the uh, quantum regime. So um, let's say familiar experiments, uh, the experiments that are very closely related to the Maxwell demon, uh, the still arranging and the Landauer erasure. And let me tell you a bit uh, about these um, because I'll be mentioning them a lot. Um, but these concepts are very similar to the one of uh, Maxwell Demon. Um, so one, it's an engine, the Steeler engine, and the idea is that you have a particle and you don't know. Now we, we are talking about just one particle, uh, but you just don't know if it's in the left or in the right side of this uh, volume, but you can put a partition and uh, there might be a, a little demon that knows if that particle went to the right or the left side. And if it knows, then it can attach a load to that partition and make the particle do work against it. So you can see it's a little engine and the only thing uh, it's powered on is the knowledge of the demon. Um, so uh, also um, correlated, um, well, uh, related to this experiment is the Landauer erasure. And uh, in the Landauer erasure, we have a, a particle that can be in the right or in the left side of this volume. And we can, you know, remove the partition and let's say make the volume um, being um, half what it was. And then what we have done, either the particle being in the left or in the right side um, to start with, it would uh, finish in a definite state. So it has started in an unknown state and it has finished in a, a definite state. So again, uh, this um, erasure of information, it requires energy to be dissipated. And this is how we save, um, again, the second law. And the energy required for uh, this uh, erasure is kVT log 2. So the Boltzmann constant, the temperature at which we so thermically uh, move the piston, and uh, the um, multiplicity of states in this case, uh, too. So um, you see that uh, here how, how the concept of information, again, um, 
it's a, it's a very interesting one and, and can lead to, um, you know, um, very interesting scenarios. So uh, let me tell you what, how um, far experiments got in this, uh, in this field, say. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna, this is not an exhaustive list of experiments. There are many others that are equally uh, brilliant. It's just that, um, just to illustrate a few points, I, I chose some. And, um, uh, of, you know, the first experimental realizations. And, and, and these um, that I'm showing you here, they, these were done with uh, colloidal particles. So uh, in collo with colloidal particles, um, it was possible uh, to show a Siller engine and Landauer erasure uh, at these uh, very small scales. So in the, Silla, in the case of the cylinder engine, there was a dimeric particle. And the idea was that there was an electric field that could be, um, that could be changed uh, once we knew in which um, direction this dimeric particle would move. Um, so in that case, what you could do is every time it, it moves in another, in another direction, that it's, for example, uh, going up in a potential ladder, um, then we can uh, let's say, make the demon act and um, go to the next uh, step in this potential ladder. So with information of the position of these dimeric particles, we could make uh, this system um, climb a uh, potential ladder. That's, um, uh, that's, I find, really cool. So, uh, and also with a colloidal particle, um, uh, and, and in this case, with optical tweezers, uh, there was a demonstration of Landauer erasure. And the idea was that there was a particle in a B stable potential. And uh, then the idea is that it doesn't matter if it's in the right or the left, but if you lower the measle potential and you tilt um, the, the potential um, entirely, uh, then the particle would always end uh, in one side of this uh, potential. So this is what we call a uh, Landauer erasure. And it's uh, shown that you need um, some uh, energy to um, to achieve this. So these were very inspiring experiments, were the first experiments on this, and um, it, it didn't stop there. Then um, also with colloidal particles, there was a demonstration of a Brownian Carnot engine and a stochastic Stirling engine. And uh, in these cases, um, Again, we have we have a potential that uh, we can um, we can tweak uh, so that you know we can do, for example, here isotherma uh, compressions and expansions of this um, of this potential. The difference of these two experiments is that in this case the temperature is like effective because we introduce some noise uh, to to for the particle uh, to feel like an, this effective temperature. Uh, and in this uh, stochastic Stirling engine, there was actually a liquid uh, which um, was with a temperature that was changed. Um, so all of this has been, you know, the start of these, um, you know, uh, thermodynamics at, at, you know, particle scale. So um, this was very, very exciting. And uh, there was as well um, a, a shunt to um, systems in which uh, quantum um, properties uh, would emerge, and this is, uh, starts to get even more exciting. So there was um, there were a couple of experiments with ion traps. So here you can see a single atom heat engine, uh, in which again uh, there was uh, some noise that would act as an effective temperature, and um, and here you can see another ion trap. And um, this is a very interesting experiment actually because. Um, here we start having an ancillary degree of freedom. In this case, is the vibrations of, of the ion. And uh, so we start generating systems that are more complex and that allows us to um, keep track of thermodynamic costs a bit better. And you would see that that's my main uh, message um, of, of this talk today. Um, there was also an NMR experiment with, um, with uh, three spins in a, in a molecule, uh, which has demonstrated uh, um, as well a quantum Landauer erasure. Um, so, you know, uh, these experiments again had opened doors into the uh, thermodynamics of quantum. 
But you can already uh, see what the difficulties here are, experimentally speaking, and they are that um, we need other systems, we, or we need a system to be a bit more complex because the most paradigmatic system in thermodynamics has, you know, a working substance like a gas, it moves a piston that can act as a battery, it has heat bath at different temperatures, we need to know uh, if this battery has been charged. So again, we need control over many um, degrees of freedom of parts of this system in order to, um, you know, uh, to understand thermodynamics um, truly in this regime. So um, there is when we, uh, you know, there is this, this great review, uh, well, insight, in which uh, the potential of electronic circuits for quantum thermodynamics has started to be realized. And um, this was pushed by experiments uh, like this one, like this still energy uh, with a single electron box. And um, then uh, later with experiments like this quantum dot heat engine. So these are systems in which we can um, play with single electrons and uh, we can um, we can therefore uh, put um, make thermodynamic processes and, and track what happens with our working substance that it's an electron or, um, well, a, a single electron or a couple of electrons. So um, this has been a, a great uh, step forward and it has been advanced, uh, it has had progress since. Um, there was also a quantum heat engine demonstrated in, a, in an ensemble of NB centers. And this is, was a, a very exciting experiment. And there was also a quantum Maxwell demon um, made in, in superconducting qubits. And this is actually, the, there is a step forward here, a very important step forward here as well, because here, this is the first experiment in which we stored the work done. So here, the work done by this quantum Maxwell demon is stored in the radiation inside the cavity uh, that reads out the, um, the superconducting qubit, uh, the superconducting qubit. So um, this is very exciting because now uh, the work produced um, by the Maxwell demon is not really lost in the substrate or lost somewhere in the circuit. It's really something that we can store and, and reuse. So this is this is a change and um, a, a very welcome one and, and I think a very interesting direction to keep on exploring. Going in, in those lines, I think something um, that we found very interesting is that this idea of reduce work and we want to use it again uh, and we want to measure it very accurately. Uh, one very um, good way of doing that is storing that work in the mechanics of a system. And there are fantastic um, mechanical resonators that can be integrated on, on chip. Um, to be uh, coupled to these electronic circuits. Um, and we have a big ranges of resonant frequencies, uh, quality factors that can be really uh, high. Uh, some of them even um, encode uh, two level systems like a single electrons. And um, they have a, a, a um, they can reach very high zero point amplitudes, meaning that uh, they can couple very well to other degrees of freedom in the system. So that makes them very, very exciting. So uh, for example, here you can see a carbon nanotube, which is suspended, um, that uh, has a very nice, um, very nice properties uh, in terms of the mechanics. So something very exciting is to bring mechanics into this picture. So here's where it comes to catapto mechanics, because now we have to be able to measure the mechanics very accurately, and uh, we have to be able to control it. So um, there we go. Uh, we need we need to catapto mechanics, and um, just uh, here in, instead of cavity opto mechanics, in which you know we have um, some radiation that can be stored in uh, in, in radiation like light. Here is just Another signal that it's um, resonant in an electronic circuit. And um, this electronic circuit can be driven 
and uh, we can observe the, the uh, reflected power of this circuit and we can couple it, for example, capacitively to a mechanical resonator. And when this uh, mechanical resonator moves, the reflected power as a function of frequency would shift. So we would be able to detect this. And uh, so it's the same, um, the same idea, um, it's just that we can do all these on chip uh, with um, our uh, very nice uh, solid state devices. So um, circuit optomechanics has, uh, you know, been um, fantastic because it has allowed uh, many exciting experiments happen, like um, there was entangling mechanics with microwave fields. Also, there was entangling of two mechanical resonators, two drums, uh, which was um, really a groundbreaking experiment. Um, so, you know, the question is, what can circuit optomechanics do for um, quantum thermodynamics? And uh, I want to show you an example here of, of something we, we've uh, done in our lab, uh, which is to uh, understand the thermodynamic, the thermodynamic cost of, of timekeeping uh, using circuit optomechanics. So let me tell you what I'm talking about by the thermodynamic cost of timekeeping. And this is a cartoon of, um, uh, made by uh, our collaborators in which um, they, they kind of illustrate the idea. Um, and the idea is that, you know, a clock is, the, is a machine. So we have a hot bath and a cold bath and the clockwork can produce ticks. And this is an irreversible process. And then we have some way to register these ticks. And, um, and this is a machine and it has, uh, therefore this, this counting time has, you know, you have to pay uh, for, there is, um, you know, no three minutes. So you, you have to pay uh, for in, in, in thermodynamic costs uh, for, uh, for every tick you count. So um, the question is, how do we measure this? How can we really, um, you know, check what are these, these costs? So, um, well, one, of, one way of doing it is again with a, with a mechanical resonator. So we can think of the clock as really a mass hanging from a spring. And, uh, you know, what we can do is heat the environment and then the, uh, you know, the mechanical resonator is gonna start to move. And we can probe this uh, motion uh, and uh, well, we can say, well, every time that we see a, a, a maximum, we would count tick, okay? So um, there we have a clock and we can count how much we heat the environment and there's going to be some dissipation of the system, of course, but we can count these the thermodynamic costs. Now, how we actually do this in the lab? So uh, what we've done was to place a very thin uh, silicon nitro membrane. Uh, this is 50 nanometers thick. You can see a, a picture of it here. Uh, over two um, electrodes, and one of these electrodes, we can we have connected it to a, to a circuit and to a radio frequency circuit that we can drive and that we can measure the reflected power of. And we can also um, excite the membrane with a given signal, for example, a, 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 well, some AC drive, right? Uh, so here you can see this is our sample in a, in a sample board, and you can see this, this cavity uh, that is formed with a reactor and uh, with, a, with um, a chip inductor. Um, so this, is, this was our experiment. And um, just to show you that we have to heat uh, our clock, uh, we, instead of driving the measurement with a coherent tone or with a single tone, we have driven it with noise. This is our way of heating effectively uh, the mode temperature. So um, this is a way for us to heat uh, the, the membrane. So, uh, and then we can monitor the cavity signal and see, as you can see here, the signal uh, that comes from the vibration of the membrane as a function of time. And again, we can say, okay, every time this goes to, uh, this has, the signal has a maximum, I would go like tick, tick, okay? So I can come ticks now. And, um, and the question is, well, how, you know, this uh, power of the noise would relate to the accuracy of, of this clock. So how much, uh, let's say, I have to pay for a good clock. And uh, 
So, and, and what um, here you can see is that again, we have the power, um, which is our resource, the, the power of the Y noise that we inject in the circuit. The circuit would have its, its uh, dissipation and we would be able to uh, see the signal in an oscilloscope and count the ticks, that's our register. So what we have learned uh, in this experiment, well, um, we, we have learned that uh, we, can, we can define the accuracy as the, of a clock, like uh, counting the ticks, the number of ticks divided by the standard deviation of the, um, of the length, let's say the time uh, space between ticks uh, squared. And um, this accuracy of, of the clock uh, is proportional, uh, we found that is proportional to the power of the noise, no of the Y noise that we inject. So if you want a good uh, clock, you have to increase the power of the Y noise you inject. Of course, there is a limit to that. And at some point there is a saturation, but um, this is uh, already a, a very interesting point. And also what we have uh, seen is that Again, this accuracy is also proportional to the entropy production of the clock. And this um, linear relationship between accuracy and um, entropy production is something that appears both in quantum and classical models of this clock. So uh, something that uh, this experiment has taught us is that um, there is a universal relation, or there seems to be a universal relation, both in quantum and classical regimes, between the entropy production required and the clock accuracy. And this uh, goes back to my main message today, which is that um, our experiment allows us to see this relation because it allows us, it, it's, a sim, it's a system that it's complex enough to um, to not be easily modeled by a, an open quantum system. Um, but at the same time, uh, so, so our system is classical, but it has simple enough, uh, it's simple enough uh, experimentally uh, to be able to account for the thermodynamics resource, uh, resources used. So um, I think this is, a, this is a very interesting point in which experiments are allowing us to see a bit more uh, if we can keep track of, of the thermodynamic costs involved. And uh, there is also uh, other systems that I find are really interesting for these experiments because they can also take us to uh, quantum states that are uh, coherent. And this is, for example, uh, one, um, one example of this, which is a suspended carbon nanotube. Um, and these carbon nanotubes, they can be suspended um, between two pillars and, and, and uh, you know, they, they are brilliant, as I said before, brilliant mechanical resonators, but also uh, they allow us to isolate uh, single electrons. So we can have uh, a single electron here as a working substance, uh, but also have the motion of the carbon nanotube as a piston. And we can also heat the electron reservoirs um, which in this case uh, are source and drain. So, um, and, and we also have gate electrodes that allows us to control this working substance, the electron and, and the motion of the carbon energy. So again, I come back to the, we need a system that can be controlled in such a way that we can really make a thermodynamic um, process um, happen. So this is uh, what I'm uh, very interested in, and this is a very promising system. Uh, of course, now, if we want to isolate a single electron in low temperatures, because we want to minimize uh, thermal excitations. So here you can see uh, our samples um, that, you know, we have to put in a park and put in a, in a dilution refrigerator at 20 millikelvin, which is um, really uh, something I enjoy doing a lot. And um, it takes us to a really interesting realm where um, we have single electrons um, and, and we can create coherent uh, quantum states. So um, here you can see actually um, um, another photo here of the another picture of our sample. And we, if we zoom in and zoom in, we can see this carbon nanotube suspended between pillars. And again, um, the cavity that we uh, can use to uh, measure the oscillations of the carbon nanotube. So um, here, uh, 
uh, so what we have is that this a single electron and uh, we also have um, you know the gate electrodes with which we can even drive the carbon energy motion and our cavity as I mentioned and because we are at low temperatures we can use our quantum limited amplifiers amplifiers uh, that uh, allow us to keep our noise levels very very low um, and another trick that we use here is that um, because uh, the carbon nanotube is very tiny, its capacitive coupling is, is weak, uh, but that can be uh, solved as well if we, um, if we match the frequency of the uh, circuit with the, me the mechanical frequency of the uh, nanotube. So um, in this way, uh, we've managed to uh, measure the, the, the motion of the carbon nanotube with a precision that is something like 470 times on the standard quantum limit. And this is our most pessimistic, um, um, let's say, estimation, because there are things here that we don't know, like at the mass, at the exact mass of the carbon nanotube. Um, but let's say in this way, we have a really good um, sensitive and fast way of measuring the displacement of the carbon nanotube. And as I said, it also allows us to, um, to isolate these single electrons and control them. So um, for those of you that are, are not so familiar with, uh, with transport, um, so what we have here, you, we have an schematic that we have because the electron um, is confined in, in a very small part of the carbon nanotube, it has uh, discrete energy uh, transitions. And you can see here the, um, the electron reservoirs. And if we apply a bias between our electron reservoirs, um, and uh, we, we can activate transport. Um, but we can also activate transport by uh, shifting the transitions with a gate voltage. So this is uh, what it's illustrated here. You can see now we have activated uh, transport through this channel. And as I said, we can also I see the current as a function of uh, gate voltage and, and we would see that uh, at some point the current is located and at some point the current increases because uh, other uh, channels for transport have been activated. Um, so if we move the bias as well, as I said, we can also activate uh, transport. So we have this basically two knobs. So if we measure the changes in current on the conductance as a function of gate and bias voltage, we would see these uh, diamond-shaped regions in which the number of charges inside the uh, carbon nanotube are fixed. And this allows us to really control um, electron by electron. So um, this, is, this is great because we have electron transport and we have the mechanics and we have an interplay between these two. And uh, we have started to see this uh, interplay uh, in action. And just to show you as, as very um, briefly one experiment that uh, that has that we've done that has shown this interplay uh, is the following. Here you can see the um, the uh, Coulomb diamonds uh, that I showed you before. These diamond shaped regions uh, showing the fixed charges inside um, the carbon nanotube. And then what we've done was to drive the carbon energy motion and see what we observe from the cavity. And its spectrum, you can see it uh, here. You can see that there is this kind of uh, very bright, um, very bright uh, resonances here that are the uh, mechanical, that correspond to the mechanical resonance of the uh, carbon energy. And you can see as well that there are that they are like arches in the signal. And, and this has to do with single electron tunneling. So that we start to see actually this interplay between electron transport and mechanics. But we can go one step further and stop driving the tube, just leave the electron transport. And what we see is that these arches, they stay. And the reason why they stay is that a single electron transport alone is exciting the mechanics. And uh, this effect of self oscillations was predicted in 2007, uh, but we just uh, observed it in such a direct way. Yeah. And uh, we can check that uh, actually, um, if we see the signal and we do an histogram of its um, amplitude, we can see that below a threshold uh, that doesn't allow for, um, for electron transport, 
uh, which is just a single, uh, a single spot in the center, meaning that the signal is not coherent. But above some threshold that allows for single transport, then we see a donut. And this donut shows that the emission is, the, the, is coherent. So, uh, and we can check that the phase um, is two. So uh, basically what we have here is some like laser analog um, because we, we have an output that it's like a, a, a coherent microwave signal. So this comes back to the idea of, you know, of, of engines in which we have a single electron, we have single electron tra transport that is powering in some sense these, this laser. So, um, this takes me to, uh, you know, that the exciting perspectives in, in quantum thermodynamics, because um, so what, what can we do with this? Well, I think that there are many uh, exciting possibilities because now we have a, a, an electron which can be in a quantum state and uh, this work can be stored in the uh, mechanics and can be used for something else. Uh, it can be reused. Um, so we, we can not only measure it uh, very accurately, but we can also, um, we would be able to do something with it, something else. So um, that's, that's um, what, what we are working towards now, having, uh, let's say, a system that it's quantum, a hot, a cold reservoir, and uh, we can do this, for example, defining two, um, a double well potential in the carbon nanotube and, and, and the electron can be in selective contact with the hot and the core reservoirs and it can be in a quantum state and um, well there are plenty of possibilities and we can even uh, start measuring the thermodynamic cost of quantum information processing. So we can try and uh, set these um, electron in different quantum states and see if we can extract work from for example, entanglement, or is it that entanglement actually uh, requires uh, work to be done on the system? So um, all these, are, there, there is a lot of um, uh, theoretical proposals. We are working with, um, well, with collaborators in designing experiments and that would allow us to access um, this, um, well, this, this exciting realm. So, uh, yeah. And, with that, I, you know, I, I, I thought I would show you some other research interests. So I showed you the electromechanics for thermodynamics. I, I do like readout as well, and we have a couple of fresh papers on that. Uh, but um, I thought I could show you a bit today, and you know, this is just to um, give you an idea of what other things uh, we do. Uh, which is the machine learning for quantum devices. And um, I, I, as, as I was saying to Edward, I think there is a lot of exciting opportunities here for experiments. So let me show you a bit how, how I see this. Um, so I think we have, we have you know, a big progress is made, made in, in the quantum technology side of things. We are trying to scale uh, quantum circuits um, and to, to, you know, um, well, there are even um, uh, 50 or 53 qubits in, in the case of superconducting qubits. And there are ion traps that are scaling up as well, semiconductor, uh, quantum dot systems. Um, and these circuits are becoming more complex and more powerful uh, in terms of the things we can do with them. Uh, but at the same time, artificial intelligence is also progressing super fast. So we've seen it really in the last few years, uh, starting to um, you know, win games uh, like uh, Go and start um, even playing more sophisticated, more sophisticated games like StarCraft. Um, so that's making really, really fast progress as well. So the big question um, that I, uh, I was, um, and that I was thinking about is how we can use uh, machine learning. How can we use these tools and what we learn from the um, artificial intelligence side of things to help us to help us in building these uh, complex um, and well and and scaling these these um, these circuits. So um, there has been there has been um, you know very good progress on this, and there was uh, machine learning um, techniques to recognize given states 
and uh, I um, classify different states or even tune um, uh, some uh, parameters to make the signal uh, in, in a determinate way. Um, so uh, looking at in, in a particular way. So let me show you what uh, you know what uh, we've done in this in this um, in this side of, of things uh, and uh, how we started really interfacing our experiments with the machine learning algorithms. So um, for this, you can think for the machine learning side of things, you can just think the um, quantum device. Um, in particular, I'm going to talk about semiconductor devices, quantum dot devices, but most of what I'm going to say is actually applicable to many other systems. And uh, in semiconductor, uh, in these quantum dot devices in particular, the, our control knobs are bias and a gate voltage. And we typically measure a current, the other uh, signals we can measure, but um, they, we basically input a gate voltage and a bias voltage and the output is a current. And uh, we do uh, these measurements of current as a function of bias and gate voltage or as a function of two gate voltages, uh, as you can see here. And you can recognize these diamond shapes again. Um, but this is very time consuming and it's very time consuming, especially because we're not interested in, in this whole picture uh, in semiconductor devices. For example, you have uh, param places in the parameter space of the gate voltage in which uh, we have a lot of current, which is not very useful or no current at all, again. But we have very small regions of the parameter space where we have single electron transport and we are interested in, in those. And as you can see, as we have more gauge voltages, these, these um, let's say surface becomes, a, well, this, this let's say um, division between current and no current because a surface and um, this, this, this parameter space grows and grows and grows as you have um, more uh, control knobs. So, um, you know, doing a back of the envelope calculation, if you, if you have one qubit, you can have four gauge uh, electrodes, and then you can, you know, if you have um, a, a voltage range between um, of four volts, and these signatures you're looking for are one millivolt. So that makes something like four times to the uh, 10 to the 12 points that you have to look at. And then if you're measuring at thousand points per second, um, well, that gives 227 years. So obviously we don't do that. We don't wait that long, but this gives you an idea of how big the parameter space is. So um, typically by hand, we should have tricks and ways to look for it. Uh, but each device is different. And this is because there are differences in fabrication, there are differences in uh, the materials. And uh, every time we have to uh, go through this tuning procedure again and again. So uh, how can uh, machine learning help? Well, we have this uh, surface here that separates current from no current. Uh, here you can see a real one, uh, one that we have measured. And the thing is, can we make an AI uh, let's say go and explore the surface in the in the search for the features uh, that we are looking for. And this is a bit for those of you that know Minecraft. This is a bit like being in a you know um, dark cave with a torch and going looking for diamonds. And when you get diamonds, uh, then you're happy. And uh, and you know you have to explore the rest of the cave to see where you would find diamonds again. So this in machine learning is is a known problem. It's the multi-arm uh, multi bandit problem. So here, you know, you have a gambler and the objective is to maximize the reward. Uh, but now the question is which machine uh, would this gambler um, play next? So it can, let's say, exploit the fact that it knows this machine here has a high current success rate and play that one or it can explore this other machine, which you know it doesn't know which is the current success rate, but uh, it might be higher. So this is um, basically uh, the idea behind, and it's called the exploration versus exploration tra uh, exploitation trade-off. So um, what our uh, uh, what our algorithm does is to um, basically. Uh, if we see this uh, current no current in, in 2D, and just for illustration, 
it will start measuring and um, the AI wouldn't know where this pink region is, but as soon as uh, in these measurements is a drop in the current, it would say, okay, uh, I think I hit a hyper surface or this surface. So it would explore around. And there are two possibilities. It's, there are features and there are no features. Um, but in this way, it would create a model of how this surface looks like. So that's fantastic uh, because with this model, then um, we can pick uh, more accurately which it's going to be the next point to explore. Or, I mean, the 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 machine would uh, pick uh, more uh, with more information where to where to explore next. Uh, and there is where it comes the exploration exploitation trade off, right? It should explore the place, but at the same point, at the same time, um, use the information it has. So about the hypersurface. So in this way, um, it would investigate around uh, a promising point and it would allow us to reach places in which we can operate our quantum node devices. For example, this island here in current. So um, this is uh, fantastic. This um, I, I was very keen on telling you about this today because we did this in eight dimensions and uh, the paper has come out in Nature Comms this morning. So um, we are celebrating that, I'm very happy. So um, yeah, welcome. Um, yeah, I hope you find it interesting too. Um, I see that I'm running a bit out of time. So I'll, I'll jump a couple of things I was gonna show you. Um, and I'll go straight uh, to the summary. Uh, which I'm going to leave there. But first, I'll, um, let me thank all my colleagues and collaborators. Um, and I, well, the, uh, here you can see a, a photo of our group showing us if, um, uh, you know, we're always looking for um, motivated people to join us and, and have fun. Uh, so, well, I'll leave the summary here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natalia, very much for that. Um, so I should soon somehow be able to see the questions, any questions that we have. Um, so I do not see in the Zoom chat any questions yet. So to remind the audience, if you have a question, please type it in the chat bar, whether on Zoom or on YouTube. Um, I could ask you a, a general question about quantum thermodynamics, which is to explore quantum thermodynamics to be properly quantum, do you need a qubit or can you exploit other aspects of quantum behavior, such as measurement back action, for example, or, or shock noise, which no. are less, less severe quantum demands? Yeah, no, uh, totally. And I think, I think um, you know, these, these systems um, that, uh, that, I, uh, that I find so interested with have, which have um, you know, like mechanics coupled to uh, quantum degrees of freedom. I think they are very complicated uh, to control in the right way. So, of course, I think these uh, we would make um, baby steps in the sense that I think there's a lot to understand first uh, without having really a, a coherent state and manipulating that coherent state. Um, and let's say, you know, build a superposition that you can extract work from, I think, uh, that's a very interesting goal, uh, but there are, as you, as you say, there are many things uh, that you can do um, without um, a, a state in superposition, and you can explore uh, many of these options in, in these systems um, with less uh, stringent uh, conditions. Right, yeah. but you think still beyond classical thermodynamics? Yeah, indeed. Um, so, for well, I mean, some of the things as, as we have learned uh, with uh, some of the aspects of thermodynamics as we have learned uh, with the clock, um, even being completely in the classical regime gives us an idea of how uh, the interface between the classical and the quantum uh, regime uh, work. So, um, so when we call non-equilibrium thermodynamics, let's say to the thermodynamics of, um, let's say fluctuations, and um, there is a lot to do in uh, non-equilibrium thermodynamics, even not going towards uh, quantum thermodynamics or, or even quantum information thermodynamics, where we got into also the, um, the quantum information side of things. Okay, I, good. 
yeah, it's, it's something uh, that I want to say that my, my collaborators, um, Janet and Alexia and Juan tell me this, um, is that it's great because this, this field brings together people from quantum information, uh, people from, um, you know, thermodynamics and more on the stochastic uh, side of things. Um, so I think there are different visions in, in, in these fields that, and, and people coming from, from very different places. Mm -hmm. uh, which I think makes it also um, very interesting. Good, thanks. Okay, we have now several questions that have come in over okay. the chat bug. Um, let me first give Sophia a chance to ask a question in the voice chat. Sure, sure. Hi. So I wrote it on YouTube as well. But um, um, thank you so much for the talk. That was really nice. And congratulations on your paper. Um, <laughs> so I, I was wondering if there's, a, if there's some exciting advantages to doing um, thermodynamics with the multi-level system instead of a two-level system, which is maybe a slightly abstract question. But I was thinking maybe this is an advantage of going to the oscillators in the sense that you have you have access to the entire Hilbert space, maybe rather than just a spin two-level system. Yeah, no, sure. And I think, um, for example, in uh, in the experiments with ensembles of NB centers, that was something that um, was clearly key to have different uh, levels in which and in that case, there were also um, vibration states and uh, part of these um, Landauer ratio, or, well, uh, scheme was, was really helped by the fact that uh, there were these ancillary systems and that it's a ladder and, and that you can really play with different, well, really different levels in the mechanics and different levels on the, uh, of the, um, quantum system itself. Um, so it's also interesting that, let's say, the mechanics, um, you can take it as classical or as quantum. And um, that that's also um, uh, an interesting playground there. Um, so I guess it's, it's mostly classical at the moment, but um, it is moving towards the quantum regime. Yeah, there are, there are um, you know, there are these experiments, for example, entangling mechanical resonators, mm -hmm. and uh, and you can cool them down to the, the ground state. Um, in carbon nanotubes, for example, because the mechanical resonances are high, mm -hmm. uh, you can even cool them down to the ground state in a in a dilution refrigerator, in principle. Um, so yeah, I, I think there is there is scope to um, to play with uh, multiple levels. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a question now from James Millen um, about the membrane. How hot does the membrane get when you heat it? And what limits that? What if you filter the noise so that more of the power is close to the resonance frequency? Yeah, well, so, so, um, so if we, if we uh, provide noise to the uh, membrane and we calculate, so this is an estimation, but we have calculated something like 10 Kelvin, or something, yeah, in the order of 10 Kelvin that we heat the membrane. And what happens is that if you keep on increasing the power delivered to the membrane, there are nonlinearities in the circuit that actually mean that, um, and nonlinearities probably in the mechanics that start to, um, that mean that you cannot effectively uh, deliver the power uh, to the membrane. Although, I must say it enters a very interesting regime as well. But let's say you cannot, let's say, efficiently um, deliver the power anymore. Um, and that's what it, it limits. And then there was a second question, Edward, sorry. Um, um, what limits um, well, that? And actually, wait, can I make sure that you answered the first question? Um, so in the, in the, he was asking about the mode of temperature, of course. Yes. Um, so, so, so we know that it, it heats up from room temperature around 10 Kelvin. Okay. And the second question... Oh, the second um, question was if you filter the noise... Ah, if you so, filter the noise. So yeah. more of its power is close to the resonance frequency, then what limits that? Well, so then um, this is um, something interesting, actually, ever and now I've been discussing, which is that if you filter... So th th this is something quite interesting, but imagine that you have a cup of tea, and then um, you feel, you know, you could, um, you know, you could filter very well the hot particles that come out and make it a clock, right? So if you filter uh, very carefully, then you, the signal, uh, even uh, let's say a, um, 
a signal without any correlations, you can correlate, you can create these correlations. So something important is to keep the filter in a way that doesn't create correlations uh, in the signal. Um, so we, we filter the noise in our, we haven't filtered the um, noise input um, in a way that would be almost driving the membrane with a, with a coherent tone. Um, but we have filtered the, the output and we've been careful not to create correlations in the, in the output signal. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. But just so you know, I think you should be able to see text versions of these questions in your oh. chats. Okay, yes. If, if you can see the chat window. If you can't see it, don't worry, I'll keep reading them out. Oh. Um, so a, question, a third question comes from uh, Andrew Armour. Um, when you showed a nanotube between a hot and cold reservoir, it looks to me a bit like a Maxwell demon. Have you thought about using the mechanics to upset the natural direction of current flow, i.e. hot to cold? Yeah, yeah, it is reading my mind. Of, yes, yes, we are thinking <laughs> about that. It's not easy though. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's, that's uh, quite uh, exciting and, and we, the problem, of course, is that there has to be some very quick uh, reaction to, uh, I mean, the Maxwell demon, it's, it's, a, it's a beam that has, to, um, that has to act quite quickly on the information it has, um, it has learned. So this means that, uh, well, it has to have very quick um, information about, uh, well, both the mechanics and the electron transport. Um, so it's just that we are a bit pressed with the how fast this has to happen, um, but um, but certainly we are we are thinking in that direction. I, I, I and we should we should probably chat more about it if you if uh, if he has the time. Yeah, I, I think it's an interesting idea. I mean, presumably you could drive the. Uh, this wouldn't be a Maxwell demon, but if you drive the motion of the nanotube then you're doing work on it, of course. And I presumably, if you arrange the levels correctly, you would use that to, uh, to pump. Yes, like, yeah, L like, you know, electron pumps that have been, uh, you know, developed to, um, to understand current standards. But mm -hmm. indeed, I think it's, it's, uh, it's well, uh, these are the kind of experiments we are, we are really um, designing and, and, and um, starting to, uh, to go into, so. Yeah, very exciting, really. Good. Andrew says thanks for that answer. Oh, thank you, Andrew. Um, good. Okay. If there are no more questions, then I suggest we finish at this point. Is that is that okay, Sophia? Uh, yeah. Thank yes. you so much, Alia. Okay. Um, well, thank, thank you, everyone, for joining. We we had some people say hi from. We had people from Sydney from the Czech Republic, I think, um, and, and for, all, for all over the place. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you. Good. Shall we do a virtual round of applause as well? Yes, let's oh, do it. I'm really yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye.